for that. Uh, hello, everyone around the globe. Good morning, good evening, whatever. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I think we have everything done. It's my pleasure to open the first like highlight of uh, uh, a Spatial Data Science Symposium of 2022. So it's my real pleasure to, to welcome Vanessa Frias Martinez um, to the stage. And uh, she will be talking about accessible cities. Um, she will be um, talking about data-driven decision-making uh, for accessible and equitable cities. So she's like an associate professor at the Urban Computing Lab at the University of Maryland. And yeah, I would say the floor is yours, Vanessa. Um, please remind her for everyone, um, we encourage you to, to post your, your questions in the Q&A tab. Also post your questions in Slack. So yeah, Vanessa. Okay, let's start. Is everybody seeing my screen, my slides? Yes. Yes, okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, so let's start. Okay, thanks a lot for the, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay, so I'm gonna start, if PowerPoint allows me to. Okay, so I'm gonna start um, asking you to think a little bit about uh, the different technologies that you use and how those technologies, as you very well know, are collecting a lot of data about how you both use the app or the technology, but also uh, about how you interact with the built environment, right? So when you're using your cell phone, you might be looking for routes on Google Maps and your location data is being collected. You might use wearables when, for example, you exercise. You might use different types of social media that collect um, various um, location data. And so, Generally, what these companies do is that they use location data for marketing purposes or to improve their product. Um, what we are interested in doing in my lab is trying to understand whether these data sets that have location information or some, some sort of location insights could be used for decision making in high stakes settings. So I direct the Urban Computing Lab, and we design, develop, and evaluate computational tools that extract insights from location-based digital traces to enhance decision-making in cities and communities. Okay, And so, um, as I was saying before, our focus is on digital traces that have some sort of location information because we are interested in modeling behavior in the built environment, in physical spaces. And so... Um, we've used different types of location data. We have worked a lot with call detail records or CDR data. These are basically data sets collected by telecommunication companies for billing purposes. I used to work for a telecommunication company before joining the university. We've also used um, location um, traces from location intelligence companies. These are GPS type of traces collected from apps. We also work with GPS traces that we collect with our own um, um, GPS collectors, and I, I will talk about this in a second. We've also worked with geolocated tweets or with micromobility traces from different types of micromobility services like uh, you know, um, shared cycling systems or scooters. So what do I mean by high stack settings? So again, we are interested in extracting insights that might inform decision making in high stake settings. So we've worked uh, mostly in three different areas in socioeconomic development, where we've done a lot of work on socioeconomic maps, and I will briefly describe this in a second in another slide. We've also worked a lot on preparedness and response, trying to understand how people respond to disasters in terms of displacements and resilience, community resilience. And we've also done a lot of work on micromobility and public transit, trying to understand urban dynamics and also trying to understand the relationships between those dynamics and um, different socioeconomic or racial backgrounds. And a sort of a cat, a cat cross theme across, you know, these different application areas uh, is what we call mobility data collection. That's another theme that can be applied to actually any high stakes settings and that is, uh, you know, really critical. And the rationale behind this research area is that as all of us are aware of, 
And these type of location-based data sets that we use contain various types of bias because of the way they are collected. Not everybody owns a cell phone. Not everybody has an app on their cell phones. Not everybody uses different types of micromobility solutions. And so if we want to use the insights from the analysis that we carry out on location data for decision-making, we have to make sure that everybody is represented within that data set, that that data set is as representative as, as possible, right? And so... We've been working a lot for the past couple of three years in what we call equitable decision making, which is mostly how can we, first of all, understand what are the biases in the data sets that we use. Second, understand how those biases might affect the fairness of the, in, of the insights that we, um, that we uh, reveal. Uh, and also a different line in, we have a new project now funded by NSF in Baltimore City. What if maybe we need to start new types of data collection processes to make sure that, you know, we collect the data that we need. So rather than reusing data sets that are collected for something different, oftentimes the solution to increase representativeness is actually, you know, collect the data ourselves. So we're also looking in all these different directions to make sure that the data that we use is representative and that the decisions that are made based on that data are equitable. And so in today's talk, I'm going to uh, delve into a couple of projects, one related to cycling, one related to fairness. But I wanted to give sort of a one slide overview of some of the projects that we've been doing in these two other areas in socioeconomic development and in preparedness and response. And I'll be happy to you know, chat afterwards if anybody's interested about these two. In the area of socioeconomic development, like one tool that we are known for in my lab is what we call the socioeconomic level maps. We don't call it, it's how they're called. And basically socioeconomic level maps are maps that decision makers compute bringing together, aggregating, averaging a set of um, variables that are computed on census data, right? So for example, if, uh, they will look at income, at access to education, access to computers, um, I don't know how many rooms you have in your household. They will pull all of these features together, compute and aggregate our average value, and that's the socioeconomic level for that area. Now, computing socioeconomic levels is important because many decisions are based on those maps. However, um, we are all aware of the fact of how expensive and how difficult it is to collect good census data, right? And so what we wanted to do in this project, which was a collaboration with the World Bank here in Washington, D.C., was basically to understand whether we could use features extracted from uh, call detail records, like how people move, how people relate to each other, to see if these features could be used as proxies for socioeconomic levels, okay? So... Um, Something like, are your mobility patterns predictive of your socioeconomic level? Or are the way you communicate with others, like the online social networks that you develop, predictive of your socioeconomic levels? These are the types of proxies that we were looking for. And so it turns out that, you know, by looking at all these different insights from the CDR data, like social insights, mobility insights, as I was uh, mentioning before, we were able to predict socioeconomic maps with pretty high um, uh, accuracy rates, F1 scores of up to 75%. And, and, and this was interesting because these results were actually only using aggregate statistics. So we were not using any individual, you know, um, trajectory patterns or anything like that, but rather we were modeling at the county level. So it's also, uh, you know, private, private preserving, but at the same time, we got pretty good accuracies. Um, and then the other area, as I was saying before, where we've done a lot of work but that I'm not going to be delving into is the area of preparedness and response. Um, and for example, one research, research project that we had in this area was trying to understand and predict displacements during IRMA. So we used both Twitter data and cell phone data. Um, that's actually a location intelligence company's data. It's GPS data. It's not CDR. And so we use those two data sets to understand things like, for example, as you can see here, where is it that people went before the landfall and where is it that people went after the hurricane? So we observed like people were going mostly for, from urban to rural, from rural to urban areas before, and then they were going back to the urban, to the rural areas after the landfall. Uh, we also study, for example, evacuation, where you see that people went based on the different resources that were put in place. And we showed that we could predict these displacements as well as resilience measured as how long do they stay in those places with um, good accuracy as well. 
And we've also done, oops, sorry, we've also done a lot of work uh, on uh, other types of disasters, like for example, you know, floods uh, in Oaxaca and and Rwanda, droughts in La Guajira, uh, you know, trying to carry out similar analysis, but on different uh, geographies. Okay, so this is like a very high level summary of, you know, some of the work that we have in these two areas. Now I'm gonna start talking about these two projects more in depth. Okay, the first project is going to be about cycling safety and the second project, as I mentioned before, about about um, fairness in the context of crime prediction. So let's start. Okay, predicting cycling safety. So um, I think that all of you, uh, many of you are probably aware of the benefits of cycling, right? Cycling is good for your health. Cycling is good for your pocket. You save a lot of money on gas and other things. And so, you know, a lot of people uh, use their bikes to go to work and, you know, to go to, I don't know, grocery shopping, take their kids to school, as you can see in this picture, right? But not everybody does that. And uh, there might be different reasons behind why people don't, you know, um, cycle to work or other places. But one of them is that uh, cycling safety is a concern, right? I mean, there's a lot of accidents. Um, uh, in the streets and also uh, deaths. And so um, the problem with characterizing cycling safety by crash numbers is that this uh, statistic is incomplete, right? I mean, so um, at least in the US, um, cycling accidents are only reported if there was someone injured who was actually taken to the hospital or if someone died. Otherwise, we won't know about many of the cycling accidents that happen, right? And so using this as a way to improve um, the, street, uh, the street network in our cities is probably not the good way to go. And so there's, we are not the first ones to look into this, but there's this push to go from crash numbers to safety perceptions, right? So maybe, you know, you don't have any accidents collected in your database at that specific street crossing, but actually people don't feel safe when they go to that street crossing, right? So how do we collect those safety perceptions, how cyclists feel about different um, uh, elements of the street network? And so there's something called cycling safety maps. So what I'm showing you here is a cycling safety map from Mon Montgomery County, which is a county very close to the University of Maryland. And their um, planning department uses these to characterize um, from, in this case, in three levels. The light blue represents very safe. The dark blue, somewhere in the middle, the, the red one represents dangerous, right? And so they classify different street segments based on how safe these segments are, okay? And then, you know, they will um, sort of understand places where they might have to intervene based on these maps. So no crash numbers in here. Um, what, how are these maps used? As I was saying before, we can identify locations where maybe, you know, uh, interventions are needed, but also oftentimes this is used to understand sort of accessibility, right? If, for example, you know that this is a residential community and this is where the school is, like, is there a safe route that will connect this residential area with a school? Same thing for, for example, grocery shopping or whatever types of trips you want to understand. And so these maps are terribly important for decision making and they are being used like planners, right? However, uh, the main problem is that the way these maps are currently computing by planning departments, by departments of transportation, is by looking at associations between street attributes and cycling safety perceptions, right? So let me unpack this a little bit more. So by street attributes, they look at measures like, for example, traffic speed, traffic volume, frequency of parking turnover, and these metrics all require to put sensors in the streets and to you know, be able to measure them. Of course, these sensors are expensive and they are not put in every single street, in the street network. Oftentimes you might also have seen cameras, like they will look at video recordings and try to understand whether you know it's a dangerous area or not. Of course, cameras are also as well expensive, not scalable. You cannot put a camera in every single street. And there's obviously a lot of privacy concerns of you know, putting a lot of cameras out there. Okay, so those are kind of the limitations of the way they're currently looking into street attributes. On the other hand, they connect those street attributes to cycling safety perceptions. So how do they understand those cycling safety perceptions? So they are generally based on logical intuitions, right? Like for example, if they see that there's a lot of traffic, like more cars, more traffic, it's associated to being less safe, which is not necessarily always the case, right? And then oftentimes it's also based on um, qualitative studies, like findings from talking with a small focus groups of cyclists, which are generally not generalizable. They've, the, its generalizability has not been validated. 
And so, you know, given these gaps in how street attributes are, um, are um, you know, computed on how cycling, cycling safety perceptions are assigned, we wanted to prop propose sort of a new approach that would cover these two gaps that I have described. So the first research question in this project which was a project funded by the National Science Foundation, was to understand whether we could find more affordable and scalable street attributes for cycling safety, right? I mean, instead of putting all these expensive sensors in a very limited number of the streets, can we explore the use of open data sets as a source to characterize or to extract you know, street attributes that could influence uh, perceived cycling safety? If we were able to do something like that, this would lower the bar of how many cities can actually compute these cycling safety maps, right? We could be extracting um, data, not from sensors that are expensive, but rather from open data repositories. And uh, more than 2000 cities out there have these type of repositories or from open street maps. Around 4 million small to mid-sized cities have that type of information on open street maps. And the second research question that we tried to tackle here was whether we could formally validate that the street attributes are predictive of the cycling safety perceptions. So the way these maps are currently built is that, you know, you have these street attributes, sort of there's these logical assumptions, we assign one to the other, and then we color the street segments. But we wanted to provide sort of a more formal method that would validate that these certain street attributes are predictive of, you know, cycling safety. <clears throat> okay. Okay. And the way we proposed to do that was by basically crowdsourcing cycling safety perceptions. So if we ask cyclists by showing them videos, how safe does this feel, we would collect that ground truth and then we build prediction models. <coughs> <coughs> okay, I'm gonna control my voice tone. I taught a class, a three hour class yesterday, so <clears throat> apologies. Okay, so the framework that we proposed was basically a three part framework. The first part was um, how do we extract these cycling safety attributes from open data sets? The second part that I'm going to be talking about is how do we collect ground truth data to, you know, like cycling safety perceptions? And the third part is how do we use the street um, segment attributes to predict cycling safety perceptions? <coughs> and I'm going to be um, describing our results for Washington, D.C. OK. <coughs> Okay, so, uh, sorry, um, so um, street attributes. Okay, so uh, uh, in order to identify different street attributes from open data sets, we basically looked into qualitative research that mostly identified two types of data sets, built environment features, like for example, presence of cycling facilities, but also social fi fabric features that might influence your decision to cycle in a given street, like for example, crime rates. <coughs> In terms of built environment attributes, we focused on extracting three types of attributes, road network characteristics, the presence of cycling facilities, and then what we called graph-based road network features. So uh, the rationale, I, I think that network, road network characteristics and cycling facilities are obvious, but graph-based road network features, what we wanted to capture with this was <clears throat> basically to understand how important different street segments are in a network because our hypothesis was that by understanding how important a segment is, uh, that, could, that could potentially be a proxy for traffic, right? So if you think of a, of a city as a graph and, you know, the, street the, the streets are either segments or nodes in your graph, if that graph is very central, meaning that, you know, everybody has to go through, if that edge is very central, meaning that everybody has to go through this edge to get to a place, then highly probably that um, edge is going to have a lot of traffic. So we wanted to use these graph-based features like centrality measures of how important segments are as proxies for traffic. And it turned out that it was a good hypothesis and that it helped a lot in the prediction, as I will describe later. In terms of social fabric features, we extracted different features based, again, on qualitative findings. So we extracted crime rates, points of interest. We also added in there bicycle crashes. We also added different types of requests related to street conditions. Like, for example, there's a lot of requests on 311. 311 services in the U.S. are basically a non-emergency service where you call when you want something in the city to be repaired. And so we were looking specifically at requests for, say, 
um, potholes in the streets, uh, street lamps that were broken and that would maybe impede um, cycling at night, you know, so sort of things that we hypothesized that could be related to cycling. So we extracted all of these attributes for DC. In the end, we had 63 different built environment features. And then <clears throat> for the social features, we computed either averages for these six types of features that I mentioned before, or we also consider different subtypes within each feature. So there were different types of crimes, different types of crash data, different types of 311 requests. And so I will describe predictive results for both <coughs> types and subtypes. <coughs> Okay, so that was the first part, right? So we use open data sets and open street maps to extract features that characterize the built environment and, um, and the social fabric. And we are not using any sensor, we are not using any camera. Ground tour data collection, how do we actually get perceptions like cycling safety perceptions from cyclists, right? Rather than, rather than assuming, you know, like logical perceptions. This is the second component of, of the platform. So, the way we did this is that we did this in collaboration with WABA. WABA is Washington Area Bicycle Association, and there's it's basically a group of cyclists that you know promote and fight for a safe cycling in the city of DC. And so what we did was record different cycling videos in Washington DC. These were cyclists that were wearing like a um, helmet camera, and they were recording um, their trips. We built a web page where cyclists could then go watch these videos and provide a rating between one and five. And then we collected those cycling safety perceptions. Let me show you how this tool worked. Um, so the website looked like something like this, right? You would enter your um, email. We would ask you uh, for you know your level of confidence when cycling. I'm gonna say I'm a confident cyclist. Then we had a survey collecting different um, characteristics like, you know, access to private car, income, type of bicycle, level of education, and so on. I'm going to skip these. And then after the survey, we basically showed 30-second uh, snippets um, that, you know, cyclists uh, needed to watch. And then based on what they saw, they needed to provide a rating from, between one and five from too dangerous to very safe. <clears throat> and give a reason for why they were providing this rating, right? And then whether they were familiar with this street or not, because familiarity might also determine whether you feel a street segment to be safe or not, right? And for example, you know, after watching this video, I'm going to say, okay, it was fair. And I'm going to say that it's based on, I don't know, the lack of um, a bike lane and that there was some traffic. You could save and continue and watch as many videos as you wanted, or you could say, okay, I'm done. And then uh, you were shown the map with the ratings from all the other cyclists that had participated. So that's how we collected uh, cycling safety perceptions. Um, we basically collected uh, around 15, almost 1,500,000 <clears> <throat> ratings from 160 participants. As you can see here, we had some very enthusiastic participants that rated uh, 60 or 70 videos, but most of them rated uh, up, to, up to 10 videos. The, the ratings that they provided from one to five, as you can see, this is the usual bell curve. When you ask participants for a rating between one and five, a lot of people tend to give you know, the label that's in between. And then for the reasons behind um, the ratings, we had the usual ones, um, bike lane design, dooring, like when someone would open the car door uh, you know, against you while you are cycling on your lane, uh, or neighborhood security were some of the reasons mentioned. And to give you just a very clear cut example of some of the ratings, this was labeled as very dangerous, this was labeled as very safe. Okay, and so now we have we have characterized the strict segments uh, based on open data sets. We have collected these ground truth perceptions. How do, pre how do we predict one from the other, right? And this is the, the different classifications mo classification models that we built for this. So we frame this as a prediction, as a classification problem, right? So we have these five different classes. Can we predict the cycling safety perceptions from one to five from the street attributes from the open data sets? There was some engineering that we needed to be in the background because as you can imagine, these videos were seen by many cyclists. And so for each street segment, different cyclists, um, for each street segment, we could have multiple labels, right? Multiple ratings. And so 
we had to collect those ratings, identify that they were assigned associated to the same street segment, and then compute averages. Once that was done, our data set was basically for each street segment, we had features and an average rating across all the cyclists that had provided a rating. And that's what we used for, you know, to train the different models. <clears throat> okay, some results. So what I'm showing here, these are different models that we tested, right? The prediction models. This is a baseline that says that predicts always the middle class, like three. Like all, it's uh, like if you were always to predict that the cycling safety perception is three, how well would you do? Okay. And then what the columns mean is that we were only using built environment features from open street maps, only social features from other open data sets or combinations of them. And this total or type is what I mentioned before that we would consider only say crime rates or by type, we would consider like different features for different types of crimes. <clears throat> Uh, and then uh, each of the numbers that you see here, there's two numbers. The left number is the micro F1 score. The right number is the macro F1 score. And the, the, the F1 micro and macro, if they are different, that's because we are not doing as well on the extreme, um, lay, on the labels for which we don't have as many data points. And as I, I pointed out before, for one and five, the extreme labels, we didn't have as many samples. And so that's, you know, classical you know, machine learning example of when you don't have enough um, uh, training data points, you're probably, not, no, you're, go you're probably not going to do as well in you know, those two types of labels. And what this is telling us is that because our macro numbers are lower than our micro numbers, we are not doing as well for the extreme labels where we don't have as many data points. <clears throat> So what you see here is that you know our based uh, case was this uh, A1 micro score of 65 the macro 42, so we are not doing as well for one and five. <clears throat> but then the interesting thing that I want you to look at it, this here is that if we were only to use built environment features, <clears throat> the F1 micro score was 62, which is very similar to the other score. And this means that we're only using uh, features from open street maps, right? So around 4 million cities should be able to extract these features without you know, putting out all the sensors and cameras that other cities are trying to put. And if we were only uh, um, to use social features, the, the micro scores would, down, would go down a little bit, but still not that much. And these are definitely values much better than the baseline. We tried to improve the macro, like the F1 macro, because we also wanted to do better for the, for the cases where we don't have as many data points for one and five, because predicting if something is very safe or very dangerous is also extremely important, right? You want to be able to predict those critical cases. We tried <clears throat> over and under sampling with this mode, we tried also enhancing the features for a street segment with features from other segments, only for those features that were spatially correlated, and that also improved the macro a little bit more. We also tried weighting the samples by cycling experience. Remember when I said, yes, I'm a confident cyclist, so we would weight differently your cycling perceptions based on how confident you were or on how familiar you were, you were with the street. And that also kind of improved a little bit the macro. Overall, if we were to do like a five class, we want to label the street segments between one and five. The best values that we got were a micro, micro of 65, macro of 48. But if we were to do something like the map that I showed at the beginning that um, Silver, um, Silver Spring is using, uh, like the planning department is using uh, to understand cycle safety perceptions with, where they only have three labels, we could, uh, the micro and macro results could be um, as high as 88 and, six, and 0.60. And of course, because we have built a predictive system, now we can actually predict values for all the street segments, right? I mean, so cyclists provided ratings for some street segments. And with those ratings, we were able to build this machine learning model that allows us to predict, given a set of street segment features extracted from open street maps, predicted for all of the street network, right? And so what you can see here is the map of VC. And each street segment is colored following these five level. We <clears throat> We could change it to any other level, right? That's just a matter of how you assign labels, but we collected them from one to five. And then for each street segment, we color coded based on that. You can see some logical things like, you know, most of the roundab roundabouts are labeled as dangerous. Um, what else I want to show you? So for example, this is 16th Street. 16th Street is a two-way uh, traffic, it's heavily used to go downtown by uh, car commuters, as opposed to 15th Street, which is a, um, it has a um, cycling path, 
Okay, and you know, all, all uh, cyclists that commute to work actually use this one. So you can see, you know, the differences in perception here. And then you can also click on <clears throat> the street segment. It will give you the address and it will also give you like, um, you know, like with what confidence does the algorithm predict that this is dangerous? So, you know, with 85, 87% confidence, this is a dangerous, you know, street segment. <clears throat> Okay, so you know, so what can decision makers do with these? So you know, these maps provide basically uh, detailed information to assess uh, cycling safety perceptions, both at the street level, but also for trip levels. You could very easily look at, okay, I have this residential area, the schools are here, are there any safe routes that are accessible to those residents? And so this is, you know, a bit, we think that this is a better approach than just using crash numbers, which, you know, don't tell, tell a very partial story. And then and these type of um, approaches can also help us identify cycling safety perception predictors. So if you look at the machine learning model, what are the predictors, right? So we observe, for example, like closeness centrality. This is what I mentioned at the beginning. So how central a segment is was highly predictive of the cycling safety perception. And we hypothesized that what this might, might be telling us is that, again, very central segments are um, heavy on traffic. So this could be pointing to, to that. It's a hypothesis. Uh, presence of cycling facilities was also highly predictive and crime rates as well. Of course, these are not causal. These are just features that help in predict cycling safety perceptions, could just be proxies of something else. But you know, it's important to understand what types of features we need to build these type of predictors. <clears throat> OK. And so I'm going to switch gears now to a completely different project. Um, <clears throat> How am I doing in time? Okay, good. And so this project, remember at the beginning that I mentioned that um, we work sort of on also trying to understand what are the issues with some of the data sets that we are using for decision making and how can we understand biases and sort of um, design interventions that would control for those biases or minimize the negative impact of those biases, right? So th this is kind of a, this project has a lot of concepts in that it's focused on fairness, but for crime prediction tools that use mobility information. So I'm going to try to unpack, I was thinking like, how can I explain all these different layers? So I'm going, I'm going to try to unpack, you know, to divide this into three different parts. I will first talk about crime prediction tools. Then I will talk about fairness, okay? And this is just like a general high-level intro. And then I will talk about our approach. So let's see if that works. So crime prediction tools. So maybe some of you are familiar with these. Um, so crime prediction tools are used to predict areas in a neighborhood where crimes might happen at a particular time. And these are oftentimes used for patrol operations, like departments, <clears throat> police departments will use them to sort of, you know, organize their daily schedules. PredPol is the best known one here in the US and it's uh, used by LAPD and other, at least 60 police departments. Crime prediction tools generally use historical crime data. They will take like two to five years of crime data and they will try to predict the future, right? And then there's been uh, also efforts in incorporating mobility data um, to improve these uh, crime prediction tools. Why? This is based on different crime theories. One of them is uh, what's called the opportunity makes the thief. So basically, if you have more people in a place, chances are that there will be more crime, right? And so the way mobility-based crime prediction models work is that they try to exploit the relationship between hotspots, basically areas that are frequently visited by people, and crime incidents. And they try to see if one is predictive of the other. How are these mobility-based crime prediction um, uh, models, how do they work? So they the first thing that they do is that uh, they compute hotspots, right? So they compute you know, areas that are highly visited in a city, and then they use that information to predict crimes. I'm going to walk you through the different parts of how these mobility-based crime prediction models work. OK? And specifically, I'm going to be using an example that um, extract hotspots using um, call detail records, okay? So um, data collected by telecommunication companies, which is basically cell tower location and time 
at which the person was observed there. And the cell tower location, um, the coverage area is generally represented by a Voronoi polygon, which is between three and four square kilometers in urban environments. So let's start. This is just how we see the mobility-based crime prediction models work. Okay. So, you know, you generally start with, um, let's see, where's my mouse? Okay. So you generally start with um, something like this. You see there like um, two different, like a, a um, region um, at different times during the day. And for that region, the polygons that you see are Voronoi polygons that represent coverage. And so what you can do is compute the hourly uh, footfall. So for each cell tower, for each Voronoi polygon, how many people were there at a given moment in time. Sometimes you might uh, need to translate those Voronoi polygons into grids because you prefer to work with grids because maybe you have access to, say, census data on a grid basis or because you want to do your analysis for zip codes or for, I don't know, neighborhoods. And so you need that translation. And so oftentimes what people will do is that they will interpolate the numbers from a Voronoi polygon to a grid. Then you compute hotspots. So hotspots are just places where uh, people concentrate more than in other grids, right? And so there's different approaches. You could just do whatever it is, you know, about one standard deviation, that's a hotspot. Uh, in this case, for this project, we used a method called LUBAR, which is basically based on the Lorentz curve. And the reason why we use this is because, because it allows us to compute sort of the upper limit of the number of hotspots that you could identify. But, you know, what you do is that you can comp you compute the number of hotspots and then you extract different features for those, for those hotspots, right? So for example, you could look into the scale of the hotspots. How many hotspots do you have? How many regions those hotspots cover? You could look into the sprawl of the hotspots. Like for example, are the hotspots a sort of um, in a, like a monocentric city, all of them in one place, or are the hotspots scattered? Is it sort of a, like a polycentric city? You could look into compactness metrics, like you know how dense these hotspots are. And so, you know, different scholars extract different types of features related to hotspots, put those features together with crime data, and then they predict crime volumes. Okay, so you have these hotspot features, you have historical crime, and then you predict future crimes. Okay, so those are mobility-based crime prediction tools. Now, let's talk a little bit about fairness in those tools. So there's prior work that has shown that crime prediction tools with or without mobility um, have unfair performance for certain protected attributes. By protected attributes, we mean um, um, socio-demographic or economic characteristics, like for example, income or race. What this means, like by unfair performance, what this means is that, for example, certain crime prediction tools have been shown to perform worse, to have higher errors, for example, for areas where there's um, a larger um, percentage of black community, okay? And so, you know, depending on socioeconomic or, so, or certain demographic features, the errors might be higher. Now, that's something that you want to avoid, right? I mean, you want to have a crime prediction tool whose errors will be similar across all protected attributes, for example. And that's just one measure of fairness, right? Like having similar errors across uh, protected groups. And there's very little work on how to address fairness issues and crime prediction tools are none on how to address um, fairness issues in mobility-based crime prediction tools. And that's you know what, why we started looking into this. Now, fairness or lack of fairness in mobility-based crime prediction can happen because of multiple reasons. It could happen because there's bias in the data like there's two types of data that are going into these models, as you as I explained before. There's crime data, historical crime data, that can be biased. There's mobility data that can be biased because not everybody owns a cell phone. Okay, and I will explain in a second why crime crime data is biased. But there's also bias that might be infused by the algorithm, right? Algorithms have been shown to amplify data bias. And so for this project, we are looking across this spectrum of, of bias in mobility, bias in crime, and algorithmic bias. But for this presentation and in this project, we specifically focused on fairness, um, trying to improve fairness based on uh, underreporting biases, on crime data that's not fully reported, right? And so crime data sets are biased because they fail to cover, to cover all of the crimes that happen. 
there's two reasons for that. There's community underreporting. Not everybody feels equally comfortable to report a crime, but there's also police underrecording. You might report a crime, but the police might decide not to put it into their database. There's a lot of prior work in this, like right, racially mixed communities have been shown to be less willing to report crimes, and no, those behaviors will change depending on the country that we're talking about. Uh, women, I think that this is worldwide, face barriers reporting sexual related crimes. And um, there's this paper focused on the United Kingdom that showed how police were more willing to rec record crimes that were reported by middle class than by low income groups. And so, you know, crime data is really not representing all the crimes that are taking place because, you know, uh, there's both um, community not fully reporting, police not fully recording. So how can we address this? I mean, if the, they, if the crime data is really not representing the actual volume of crimes, uh, and that might in turn impact, for example, the errors that the model is outputting, in outputting higher errors for you know, certain races, for example, what we proposed to do was to build a crime prediction model that on top of the hotspot features and the crime historical data incorporated domain knowledge about the underreporting, about how the underreporting is happening. If we incorporate that there's this process of underreporting into the model, can we improve the fairness of the model? We hypothesized by, that by incorporating this domain knowledge, the, the performance would be more similar across different protected attributes. Okay, so what model did we propose? We propose what we call Berg, hierarchical Bayesian model. Let me walk you through. I don't like putting formulas, but th these are very, uh, you know, clear cut formulas that uh, are, you know, actually make my life easier to explain you how this process works. And I don't have a pointer. I don't know why. But if we go to the first line, the true crimes, what we are saying here is that in reality, there's an actual volume of crimes Y that's happening, that it's not recorded in the data sets that we generally, that we generally use when, you, when we download those data sets from, you know, from um, open, open data set platforms. So this is the actual volume of crimes that happens that is underreported and underrecorded. But there's a number out there that we don't know, and that number is why. Then we have the reported crimes, second line, the ZI. And those crimes are the crimes that the numbers that we get from those data sets that we typically work with. Right. And so we argue that those reported crimes are happening at a given rate, lambda I, which is the crime occurring rate that's discounted by the reporting rate. So we have an actual crime occurring rate, but that's not going into the data sets that we use because people are not always reporting that. And then the way we solve for lambda and for pi for the crime occurring rate and the reporting rate is by saying, I'm on the third line now, sorry, I don't have a pointer. On the third line, crime occurring rate, we explain the crime occurring rate based on hotspot features. So these are, you know, the what I was talking about before, the compactness, the sprawl, like features that characterize hotspot distributions. We use those to predict crime. But uh, on, on the other hand, the pi, the reporting rate, is explained with the underreporting features, like, you know, things that I mentioned before, like income or gender, um, socioeconomic level that might affect, you know, whether you report or not. And so we are in this model, we are introducing two things. The first thing is this underreporting process that's happening because of certain underreporting features. And the second thing is the true crime volumes. Like, can we actually sort of approximate what the actual volume of crimes could be, given that we know that there's this underreporting process taking place? And so uh, how do we train these? So, you know, we started with mobility data, we could compute hotspot features, we extract the underreporting determinants, and we built the, the Burke model that we have proposed, but we also built other models uh, just to compare against our hierarchical model. We also used like random forests, um, uh, XGBoost, and uh, included the underreporting features, but not specified as an underreporting process, just as additional features into the model. And then what we, uh, what we did was compare the performance of our model with the performance of other models that are not directly specifying the underreporting process and see if you know, we were doing better in terms of performance across groups. How did we evaluate this? So we evaluated it using uh, cell phone data for approximately 14,000 municipalities in Mexico from the year 2010. 
And we also used crime statistics, official crime statistics for property and violent crimes uh, from 2011. In terms of determinants of underreporting, we considered, you know, poverty rate, unemployment, um, rate of adults, um, marriage rate, and male to, male to female ratio. For the BERT model, we used MCMC sampling to infer the jump posterior distribution. <clears throat> the baselines that I mentioned before uh, are uh, random forest bagging and SGBoost. And then we use fivefold cross validation. <clears throat> Basically, you know, train with four tests, win one, and repeat five times. Now, how did we um, define mm, fairness? So we define fairness as, you know, having approximate parity across protected attributes, right? So we want the model to perform similarly across protected attributes. If there's going to be an error, we want those errors to be similar. And we consider two protected attributes, income and indigenous population. This is in Mexico. So... Um, you know, the, the, there's racial problems mostly based on indigenous population there that are not given the same rights. And so using census information from the, tw from the same year, from 2010, we considered four income levels from the lowest ICQ-1 to the highest ICQ-4, and we considered four levels of indigenous population from zero indigenous population uh, to larger than 40% and then lower than 40% for Populations is smaller than 5,000 or larger than 5,000. We consider these four different groups. Now, how, do we, how did we measure fairness to show that our model is doing better or not than other models? So we used two um, metrics, two parity metrics that are heavily used in the literature. Uh, the first one is root mean square error parity. The example that I was giving before, we want uh, to measure the difference between <clears throat> between the actual number of crimes and the predicted number of crimes. And we want to show that the errors that we make in those predictions are similar across income groups and across indigenous groups. And then the mean difference part is another metric that's sometimes used in the literature, but that not everybody likes it, okay? But, you know, we use it as well, which basically tries to push the algorithm to... Um, produce a similar prediction. So in this, in this case, the hypothesis would be that we have these different areas. Crime predictions should be similar. Crime volumes should be similar across groups. And so what we are measuring here is the difference between the crime volume for one group and the average for all of the other groups. And we want that difference to be as small as possible. We want similar volumes of crimes across um, income and indigenous groups. OK, so. <clears throat> Taking the Burke model, the other um, random forest XGBoost models that um, I mentioned before, incorporating the underreporting process and measuring the fairness metrics, let's let's see uh, what we got. Right, the results that I'm going to describe are just for violent crimes and income groups. <clears throat> Many of the other results are in a paper that I'll be happy to share. It's also available online. So, <clears throat> what am I showing here? So, this is for property crimes and income groups. Okay. The, the, these are the columns are the income groups. One is the lowest income group. Four is the highest income group. Columns are the different models that we considered. Remember that what we are measuring here is the difference between the number of crimes in the data set that we use and the number of crimes predicted by these models. And then for each number that you see here, this is the root mean square error. And the number between parentheses is the normalized error by group average. OK, so taking all the column. So there's two things that I'd, I'd like you to <clears throat> look at um, in these results. The first one is that the BERT model that we proposed <clears throat> decreased the root mean square error across all income groups, except for, income, uh, for group income three, which is one of, of the higher income groups. OK, so the Berg model is achieving higher fairness across the majority of the income groups. And also the second really interesting result was that uh, we were, um, if you look at, you know, the different numbers between parentheses in column Q1, you can see that these numbers are really high for random forest bagging and XG boost. And the Berg model actually reduced, produced the largest improvement uh, compared to all of the other groups, right? So for, for the low income, which is generally, you know, the more marginalized uh, groups, um, we were able to improve the fairness much more than for any of the other groups as well. So we were able to reduce the error much more than, you know, for any of the other groups as well. 
And then the other metric that we use, the normalized mean difference, uh, here again, the columns are income, the, um, the different rows are the different models. Here we have two Bergs because the Berg model, remember that it outputs the C value, which is the prediction with respect to the actual data set. And the Y value is just like the total number of crimes that we believe are happening when you model the underreporting process, but that we have no way to actually check it because, you know, there's, we don't know that number, although I will, you know, talk briefly about that later. And so what you can see here is that if you look at our Berg model for the hypothetical actual volume of crimes, um, it actually um, is actually the one that improves the normalized mean difference uh, more than any of the other models. So if you look at the APSUM, the 3.66, that's just like the average absolute value across all of the normalized mean difference. And what this means is that the Berg model um, produces uh, or predicts volumes of crimes that are more similar, most similar across income groups. And that's, you know, the objective of these uh, um, parity metric of this fairness metric. Okay, so to summarize findings, so we've shown that by incorporating how the underreporting process takes place into the model, in the Berg model, we can achieve higher parity across protected groups. Um, and both in terms of uh, reducing the root mean square errors across income groups, but also in terms of producing similar volumes of crimes across protected groups. Now, how can this model uh, be used for decision making as well? So um, I want to discuss a couple of things. So the first thing that I want to discuss is this underreporting prevalence. So if you remember, we had in the model, I don't have a pointer and it's really frustrating, but if you look at the right hand, uh, like low, right low hand side of the slide, you see this YI lambda, you know, the formula, the Poisson, the Poisson formula that we put for the Berg model. So this Y, again, is the, the actual volume of crimes that we think are in reality happening. These are not reported. These are not found in any database, right? These are not in, uh, found in any open data set. But this is the actual volume of crimes that we think are actually happening. So if we look at this YI, okay, what we did was uh, compute the reporting rates, right? We know how many crimes are reported. We know the actual YI. That's the one that our model outputs and we computed the reporting rate, right? So how many crimes of the ones that our model is saying that are happening are actually in the database? That's a reporting rate. And what we showed here is that for around for violent crime, the blue um, histogram, around 94% of the municipalities in Mexico have less than 10% of the violent crime being reported, okay? Again, this Y number is a number that our model is outputting. There's no way of having this ground truth because you know, nobody actually knows how many crimes are actually happening. However, in talking with uh, you know, the INEGI, the Statistical Institute in Mexico, they had this survey, NVIPE survey, from 2010 to 2014, in which they actually asked, you know, just like a survey, population level survey, where they asked people you know, whether they had suffered any crime in the past you know, uh, in four years. And they actually got similar percentages in terms of underreported crimes to the ones that we were getting here. So that's the only ground truth that we can get, you know. But, uh, you know, what our model is um, reporting, uh, the model that incorporates this underreporting process, it's that, you know, um, high volume of crimes are just not, not being incorporated into the database. And then a second interesting, you know, uh, use of the models that we designed uh, are basically... Um, you know, try to identify insights of the <clears throat> relationship between mobility or hotspots and crimes, um, but also relationships between crimes and different um, and demographic socioeconomic features. If you look, you know, on the left hand side, true crime prediction, that's the formula that we use in the Berg model. So how the actual crime occurring rate lambda is related to hotspot features. It's just a linear regression. So we can kind of unpack what's happening if we look at the, if we do like a coefficient analysis for the regression. And we observe, for example, that um, higher um, mobility or higher, you know, um, volumes of hotspots were related to higher volumes of crimes. You see the positive um, coefficient there. Or for example, that, um, that um, the larger the spread, the lower the volume of crimes, meaning that the larger, the more the hotspots were sort of spread out in a city, like in a polycentric city, the lower the volume would be. And then for the crime reporting prediction, for example, we also observed 
<clears throat> higher poverty related to lower crime reports, which is pointing to something that, you know, a lot of uh, qualitative literature has already shown that, you know, low income individuals are not reporting crimes with as much frequency as sort of middle and high income individuals. So, you know, hopefully uh, we uh, believe that the Berg model can be used to, first of all, quantify how bad the under the under reporting phenomenon might be producing, you know, approximate values of the actual under reporting, taking into account under reporting processes into the modeling. It can also be useful to understand um, the socioeconomic features that might be influencing under reporting behaviors but also to quantify the relationship between, between crime and mobility, mobility measured as, as hotspot features. And of course, I want to finalize by saying that, you know, these projects are a uh, team effort. I'm the one talking today, but there's a lot of colleagues and uh, PhD students and master's students and undergraduate students that have helped throughout. And, you know, they are here. These are their names. And thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to stop sharing now. Thank you so much, Vanessa. That was an inspiring talk. Um, and I think we have a number of questions. Um, first one is from Francis Harvey. Um, he used to sit next to me, but just left because he has an other appointment, which is a pity. So Francis um, asked, were you able to consider mob issues in your analysis with CDR data for the SEL data sets? Was I able to consider, um, can you repeat the question? Um, if, if you were able to consider MOP, so modifiable aerial unit problem issues in your analysis with the SEL data sets. Yeah, so we actually have a paper out there uh, that looks precisely into that. I, if you send me the email of that person, I could share it with them. Um, we try to understand whether, you know, uh, considering like different um, region sizes or, you know, different types of grids or different geographical distributions actually impacted our results, not for the socioeconomic level, but for um, the number of hotspots. Um, and it was kind of a mixed findings paper. Like we couldn't find anything conclusive. Um, I'm not, I mean, I'm happy to share that paper. I don't have any highlights now because it was extremely inconclusive. And our conclusion was that we couldn't conclude anything. Uh, but I'd be happy to share the paper. Please send me their email and I'll be happy to do so. We didn't do that in the context of socioeconomic levels. And that would be interesting to do as well. We did that in the context of... Uh, will the number of hotspots or the distribution of the hotspots change if we were to consider, you know, changes in, in geographical distribution areas and so on? Yeah, perfect. So I could uh, I could forward you the email from or the contact Definitely. of Francis, so that that wouldn't be a problem. Um, we do have a couple of more questions. Um, let's say um, from Anna. Yeah, that was exactly what I was thinking of. Um, so. From, from Anna Baziri from UK. Uh, could you comment on how the count for survival bias, for example, if a road is not safe or a few cyclists go through, uh, so there are a few cyclists, a few accidents recorded, if, if there's something in your study or B, if the diff what, what about the difference between the perception of road safety and the actual real safety? Is, is there any difference or what, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, so the, the first part of the question is really interesting. We actually did observe that when um, cyclists collaborated with the recording, there were certain street segments for which we did not have enough uh, recordings. We didn't know if it was because of how the street network worked or because they were actually avoiding those. So we also had students, you know, cycle the city <laughs> um, uh, so that we would also have videos from street segments that were missing. Of course, we didn't collect all of them. It would be impossible. And otherwise, what would be the purpose? I mean, the purpose is to develop a prediction model that will actually prevent you from having to record all the segments. But, you know, uh, we did have students cycle around to uh, partially avoid that. I'm sure that, you know, there's still some bias in there. And then for the second one, that's a question that I always get asked when I present this, this, um, this project. And especially like when I presented like in um, transportation or, or civil um, engineering departments, 
they are very adamant about using, you know, like crash data because that's the data that actually represents danger. Um, I, I would say that it's like two different ways of, of measuring it. So, so perception is, so what we want to do with these maps is understand whether someone is going to cycle from A to B, right? Whether someone is going to use their bike to go from A to B. And so it really doesn't matter if it's actually dangerous, if people are not going to cycle through that segment because they perceive it's not dangerous, right? So our approach to this is you want to have a safe network that cyclists perceive as safe. And so you might think that it's not dangerous because the crash numbers are low, but cyclists are avoiding that drought because they perceive it as unsafe. And so we wanted to emphasize on that perception that might prevent you from actually using that drought as opposed to actual danger. What's actual danger? Danger is also you know, very uh, subjective, like what's dangerous. It can be different things for different people. In the end, as, as a decision maker, you have to decide on, you know, what streets are you going to improve? And so, you know, um, it's impossible to adjust specific street segments to a specific individuals that might be more scared than others. But if there's, you know, a perception from um, a high number of cyclists saying that they perceive that street as unsafe, maybe, you know, the city should go and check it and see why is that unsafe uh, perception of unsafety ha actually happening. But both those are really great questions. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, um, Vanessa. I was just reminded that we are a little bit behind schedule and maybe uh, you could join the speaker Q&A table um, during the break because we have a break until 4.15, so like 10 minutes break or so, comfort break. Um, so maybe you could join this uh, speaker Q&A table and uh, the other participants who have a question which is still unanswered you could uh, go there and, and ask Vanessa directly. This would be, I guess, the best option um, in order to proceed, if that's okay. I can also stay here if it's better. If you think that it's better, instead of writing the answer, answering in person, I can also do that, whatever you, whatever the organization prefers. Uh, but it, it's actually, it's better to, to proceed to the uh, speaker Q&A table in order because Perfect. we need to prepare the next session. So And you can okay. actually talk and show your face during the table. Yeah, and you, you can show and talk your, your face during the table so you don't have to type so you oh, can talk okay. to each other. So that's like a real table, but just in a virtual okay. form. So that's how it is. Okay, <laughs> thanks again. Thanks again for the many questions uh, that we received. Uh, it was really a pleasure. Um, this talk and really enjoyed our enjoyed the talk and it was a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much.